advised, you have Hog 5-3 still on station, and you have Hog 5-5 five five in route to rip with that uh, aircraft, over. What you just heard was not Hollywood. What you just heard was not people in an audio booth trying to make something for a movie. What you just heard was hell. That was my team leader on April 6, 2008, calling in medevac trying to get the Green Berets that were wounded that day out of harm's way. What you just heard was real. What you just heard was one of the hardest days that in my life, one of the times that I never gave more effort one of the times that I would never been more scared, one of the most difficult times, and yet, that day, before I tell you that day, I want you to tell you, I want to bring you back to what it was like the day before, right? The day before, whenever you wake up, or, and, and it's, it's, it's raining outside, and you're, you gotta go do bad things to bad people, right? Because that's what Green Berets are gonna do, right? That's what I want to tell you about what it was like. First of all, do y'all even know what a Green Beret is? No, we're not like Navy SEALs. We don't have good hair and write books. See, that's the big difference. Any Navy guys in here? Come on. It's a lot funny when we got a Navy guy. No, uh, the, the biggest difference and differentiator that I always tell people about what a Green Beret does is it's our job to go into a village and teach a thousand so they can fight for themselves. That's pretty awesome, right? One, you, you, you know, the, the old saying, you teach a man to fish, he, he feeds forever, rather than giving him a fish, he feeds for a day. But most importantly, we go into these communities and we teach them how to fight for themselves and liberate themselves from oppression. That's pretty awesome, right? You know, so not only do we go and we have to learn the, the techniques and procedures of battle, but we also have to know a, a different language, right? So uh, I can say, je ne pas parler français, je suis américain, which means I don't speak French, I'm American. That was the first thing I learned whenever, because uh, we do a lot of stuff in Africa. And uh, quick story, it was real awesome whenever we went into the French training. You know, 98% of all the teachers are all African speaking French with an African dialect. Well, you know, John Wayne, redneck from Grosbeck, goes in there. I get a lady from France with zero personality. So as soon as I get in there, I'm like, let me tell you about little the guy named, uh, what was the name? Not Lane Frost, I'm thinking of uh, Lance, Lance Armstrong, you know. She's like, Monsieur Walding. I'm like, what, man? You won seven times. You know, this is, but anyway, we, we ended up liking each other. But that's one of the things that it makes a Green Beret. On top of that, you can't just raise your hand and say, hey, I want to go to Green Beret school. It doesn't work that way. You actually go to a selection process. It's a 25-day selection course, right? So again, SEALs, they got hell week. Well, we got hell month. You know, not that it was a competition, but if it was, you know, we're winning, right? So that 25 days, you get your butt kicked. I'll just sum it up into that, right? They, they teach you not only physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, they make you see if you got it. And to put things into perspective, there were 400 candidates that started day one of selection process. At the end of the 25 days, there was less than 100 even standing. Everyone else had quit. Out of those probably 80 that were standing that day, less than half were selected. That's to start Green Beret School, right? So you got a year and a half after that of the gut check day in and day out to see if you really had what it takes to be a Green Beret. And after two years of training, standing on that parade field in August in uh, North Carolina, when that commander said, Dawn, you're a Green Beret, it was one of the most profound moments of my life. And so I'm for fast forwarding back to uh, the morning of April 6th, right? So you kind of understand what we're here to do, right? We fight with the, um, the, the indigenous forces that we're trying to help. Well, we, go, we wake up that morning and it's raining, right? If you know anything about rotary helicopters, right? They don't like to fly in the, in the rain, right? A lot of ceilings and uh, low ceiling with cloud cover. It's just a very dangerous thing. And so our initial idea was we're not gonna go, we're gonna get stood down, which you know typically does happen a lot when you have an op tempo like we do. You know, the weather you're always, the mission is dictated by the weather. And uh, 
But just like what we do here, right? Even though you don't think something's going to happen, you're going to do what you're supposed to do. And we've gotten our ready room. And I always like to tell what a ready room looks like because it gets you an idea of what we're going through that morning when it's 4 o'clock in the morning and, and you don't know what's going to happen that day. We go in, it's kind of like a locker room, right? Do you understand? You got your lockers and, and uh, in the middle there's a big table, right? But instead of like a football locker room where you have shoulder pads and a helmet, right? We have body armor and a helmet, you know, and about four or five different guns, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We had choices, right, of what we were going to do. And uh, what you would do is you'd grab your body armor, you'd turn around on that ready table, and then you would just customize your kit for whatever mission you're doing, right? This Today or that day, we were doing an air assault raid, right? We're going to get on helicopters, we're going to go fly into the mountains, and we're going to go climb it and do bad things to bad people. That's what we're going to do, right? So... Since we're climbing a mountain that day, we wanted to slim it down, right? So no, we're not going to take extra mags. We just had one basic combat load, which is really six magazines and one in your gun. You know, you may only have one camp of Copenhagen, not two this time, right? Because if you're going out of a truck, you know, you, you, you plus up on everything because you're not going to be walking as much, right? You'll take one, not one, but two cases of rippets. Anybody here know what a rippet is? Huh? It's like a Red Bull cocaine, man. We love it. Woo! I don't know how it's legal in America, but if you ever get a chance, go ahead, try it. You know, uh, <laughs> but we had, you know, you was, so that's the, the, the mindset of every single mission that we went on. We made sure that we would uh, be ready for that day. And from the ready room, we go into our non-tactical vehicles. Now, this is when it starts kind of being like the movies, right? Because you're walking outside of this, you know, little hut and, and uh, you got your Land Cruisers, your Toyota Hiluxes, you know, all those cool guys, you know, things that you see on TV. And we load up. And then we're driving out, you know, in the cover of darkness, right, out to the airfield. You know, so imagine this airfield that's in the middle of Jalalabad, right? We call it JBAD because we like acronyms in Jalalabad. That's a lot, of, uh, a lot of syllables that, you know, redneck doesn't like to say. But we were at JBAD, and, and imagine being uh, in the cover of darkness going out to this airfield, and you just see helicopters lined up, right? Again, it's just, this is a, the, probably the, the closest thing to the movies that they portray because they're just sitting out there and you come in and you just see the headlights coming into the side of it again you don't have to go through tsa you know they take your knife and all that stuff but you go right up next to the helicopters and your doors open and you start getting ready and uh that's when the fun starts happening when it starts sinking in because you're there like okay i think we're gonna do this well we're getting to the point now where we meet our host nation force right our host nation force was the afghani commandos remember we don't just fight by ourselves we fight with others and the Afghani commandos at the time, they were the Green Berets for the Afghani National Army. They had a selection process just like we did. They had a Q course just like we did. And when they graduated, there were some absolute just studs of a firefighter for, uh, for the Afghani army. And, and we would get with them and, and uh, get our accountability. And we had a couple celebrities there. I never will forget, first time calling row, I saw Muhammad Ali. I was like, Muhammad Ali, where you at? You know, and he, it, obviously, we weren't the first Green Berets that he dealt with, so he, he got the joke. And, and uh, so I was like, what's going on, hero? You know, and uh, we had another guy we named Joe Pesci. He looked just like Joe Pesci, just with a beard, right? So you see a little brown guy with a beard, and, and uh, he was just a great guy. And, and uh, he was our RPG gunner. So, he, you know, we had Joe Pesci in charge of the RPGs, so that's pretty awesome. And, and uh, we actually became pretty good friends because whenever we would go uh, out to formation, I'd look at him like, Joe Pesci, what's up? He'd look at me like, John Wayne. <laughs> He gave it a thumbs up. He's like, John Wayne, you know, that's the only English he knew. And, and uh, you know, I, I say this with, with uh, just so you know the, the relationship between us and the Afghani commandos. We really did have a great relationship with them. We fought with them. We ate with them. We slept with them. We were a very, very close knit. In fact, towards the end of our last deployment, and we were going into villages, and, and like if we were going to go into a house, they'd stop us and they'd go in first they understood the sacrifices that we were making it was like no 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 this is our country we're going to go in and this is what we're supposed to do so they were I, I wanted to make it uh, a, a point every time that I speak to let y'all know that there were some great people there that we were working with so we get connected with them and that's whenever you, you you get the accountability whenever you start hearing the rotors like if you ever heard a helicopter start right you all know what it sounds like you hear that jet motor just started it's getting slow it's getting faster now it's getting faster and now you hear those rotors just dunk, 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 right and it's just that that i you know I, it's not ptsd from it i just love the sound of it. every time i hear a rotor i'm like all right it's go time you know i just always get that that feeling because that that's one of the uh, most awesome feeling in the world is is being on that helicopter and, and uh so we go into the helicopters right we had two u-860s which is a black hawk 
and then we had uh, two CH-47s, which is a Chinook. Chinook, if you don't know what it looks like, it's basically a bus with a rotor on the front and a rotor on the back and a tailgate that you run in and out of. That, that's basically the size of what a Chinook is. And uh, we go into these helicopters and, and sort of get you an understanding what it felt like at the time, right? So at this time, we still don't know if we're going. Again, now it's about five o'clock in the morning, so you can start just barely seeing the sun, you know, with that early morning twilight, right? Where you can just start making out things out in the distance. You're inside this helicopter, it's cold, it's shaking, it's chaotic because you got all the rotors going. You got your headset on, you're listening to the ground force commander, to the pilot, to the talk commander. Like, so you got all this chatter going in, getting real time updates. Is the guy still there? Has he left? And, and all this stuff. And, and then you hear those, those three words that every cool guy wants to hear. Execute, execute, execute. And that's whenever the wheels lift off the ground. And we tell you, whenever those wheels started to live off the ground and you get that feeling, that feeling's called living. Right? Because, like, right now, we're not just living. Right? It's, it's, we got sunshine and butterflies. We're in the AC. If it rains, nobody, nobody's shooting at us, right? That's, that's not a big deal. When those wheels took off the ground, think about this. I didn't know if I was going to be alive when they landed. So how do you think you're going to feel that day? That's living, right? I didn't know I was going to be alive for the next day, the next minute, the next hour. So when you're living in that space, everything is just so much more intense from the love to your brother that's next to you, right? That you're sitting next to and you're just looking at him and you, you may be giving him that final goodbye, right? You already gave him your note. Say, hey, man, if I don't make it out, Give this to my kid, right? That, that, that sunrise that now you're starting to watch, that's God's creation that you may not have ever marveled before, but that might be your last, right? Just seeing the trees go in the wind, you're like, man, that's pretty awesome. That's what it's like when you're living. And we did about 30 minutes of living on this helicopter. Again, with the headset, imagine you're crossing all these phase lines. Phase line alpha hit, all right? So I know phase line, I got 10 minutes left. Phase line bravo hit. Oh, bravo hit, that means I'm, I'm 15 out, five out one minute out and at one minute everybody said or excuse me at five minutes that's when everybody stands up and you yell out throughout the aircraft five minutes and we stand up and we start checking each other make sure nothing had, you know gotten caught make sure that we're all ready to go then you do the one minute time hack one minute time hack everybody starts facing outward toward the door you see the door it's already been down because that's how we ride we ride with it down in case we have to bail out and then there's a, to the top right there's a little light a little light that everybody's always looking for. It's that green light. And then you get 30 seconds, stand by, and that light goes on, and that's when we start running out the back of this aircraft. Problem is, when we ran out the back of the aircraft, we weren't on the, we weren't on the ground. So what Mike Tyson eloquently said, right, everybody's got a plan to get punched in the face, right? That's exactly what happened to us. We start running out this helicopter, and we had to drop 10, 15 feet onto uh, jagged rocks with 60 pounds of kit on top of you, right? So we thought right out the gate we were going to lose 15, 20% of our element to a uh, sprained knee, twisted ankle, right, just from that uh, aspect alone. And, and fortunately, nobody was injured, so we got our accountability, and we started marching toward the objective. The objective, it was 10,000 feet above sea level. So imagine that, right? So April 6, 2008, right, so you're in the uh, uh, early April in 10,000 feet. Any mountain people in here, you know exactly what that's like, right? It's still cold, there's still snow on the ground, and, and it's, a, uh, it's, an, it's a, 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 an environment that's not very advantageous to uh, get in a firefight, put it that way. And uh, we start climbing the mountain. When I say we start climbing the mountain, I want you to know that's literally what we were doing, not figuratively just walking up a steep grade. There were just cliffs and terraces that you had to use your knee that your buddy would grip onto and then get to the next level, pull each other up and do that till we got to the objective. So imagine what that was like, right? You already got punched in the face because we, we had to jump out of the helicopter. Now we're sitting here, we got to uh, literally climb a mountain just to get into a fight, right? I was the assault team one leader. So I was the first guy in the house, that was my job. My job was to be the first guy into this village, locked down me and my team, right? So it was my team. Again, I had uh, Dave Sanders, which was another Green Beret that uh, was on our team. It was his first time in country. It wasn't his first firefight, but it was one of, one of his first. You know, Dave Sanders was, I always tell the story about Dave because 
Well, first, he was the guy that put my tourniquet on, but second thing was he, he was an ice figure skater, right, which is awesome for a Green Beret team to find out that, oh, you were a figure skater? So we went straight to Google, started printing out things with him on the stage, you know, and putting him on his locker. He's like, come on, guys. You know, the, the only saving grace for, for Dave is that he was, do, he, he, it was couples. I'm like, all right, you're doing it with a girl, all right, so you're not just doing it by yourself, you know, but, uh, but yeah, he was a figure skater, who knew? He, and a good one, by the way, like he crushed it. He was like number three in the nation. It was awesome, you know, and jokes on us, though, he became Delta Force after that, right? So he really was, uh, he was a stud. But I had Dave with me, and we had our, uh, our interpreter, Booyah, that was his name. That, that's the name that we give the, the Terps that, by, it's their, their name. It's not us making fun of them. That's the one that they gave to, uh, that he gave to us. We had a guy named Noodles. We had a guy named Booyah Blade. Blade was awesome. He was our, Z was our house terp. We had a guy, uh, Charlie Sheen, no kidding. We had a Charlie Sheen. He was the house terp. And uh, they just was absolute great guys. And, and in fact, let me stop and just say this. You think an American is worth a lot in Afghanistan? What about an Afghani that speaks English and helps Americans? Think about what they sacrifice to help not only us, but their country. These interpreters are some of the most patriotic, heroic, absolute great war fighters on the planet. And so if you ever have a chance to go meet one or you do meet one, please know that you're in the presence of someone that's awesome. All right, because they, they really do sacrifice. So we, we had Blade with us. Sorry, we had Booyah with us. And then we had our eight commandos, right? That, that's our, uh, our assaulting team that was supposed to go into this village right, and, and just lock in that first house, and we were going to leapfrog all the way to the X, right, that's what we're supposed to do, so imagine we're just, you know, zigzagged up this mountain, strung out like ants, and I'm about 40 yards from my position to the first building into the village, and that's when we got opened up on. I say we got opened up on with an avalanche of gunfire, not to sound cool, not to beat my chest, but that's because exactly what it was, and to put it into perspective, you know, I've already been speaking for, what, about 10 to 15 minutes. Within that time frame, we already had CK, our lead interpreter, got shot in the throat, died on impact. Dylan Bear, radio transmitting operator, he was an 18 Echo Green Beret, got shot in the hip. Initial assessment on him, 20 minutes to live. So put your mindset into here, right? You already got your face punched whenever you got off the plane. Now you climbed the mountain, and now within the first five minutes of getting shot at, what do you think is going to happen with Dylan? You think we're gonna get a medevac in? You think we're gonna suppress the enemy whenever it gets here? You think we're gonna get him on? There's no way that's happening in 20 minutes, right? So what are you thinking? Dylan's dead. Not only that, Luis Morales gets shot. He's the uh, 18 Fox, the uh, military intelligence officer of the Green Beret, and his job, what, whenever we go into one, build the intel, right? That's another unique thing about Green Berets is, is that we don't just execute missions, we actually build the target packets and collect the intel or, and the data ourselves to say, hey, look, here's the bad guy, here's why he is, here's his auxiliary, and here's what we're gonna do, right? That's what we were supposed to do, and that's Luis's job, is to go in and build that intel. Luis didn't get shot once, but he got shot twice in his leg, and I'll never forget the sound over the headset of Luis's voice saying, John, come get me, brother. If it's not profound to you, it should be, because you don't say that over the military radio, do you? You have call signs. Bravo 1, this is Echo 1. Bravo 2, this is Charlie 2, right? You have these call signs that you always use when you're on the radio. What was Luis saying? John, come get me, brother. So imagine what that first 15 minutes was like. CK's dead, Dylan's dying, now Luis is so bad, he's calling me by my first name over the radio, right? And it was one of the things that really motivated us to just dig our heels in and, and start fighting. And we did a pretty dang good job of, for about two hours. You know, after those three, you know, were injured, we, our team moved back down from our position because a lot of the fire was headed behind us, right? So we climbed back down the mountain to the command control element where Luis, Dylan, and all of them were and pretty much initiated Operation Human Shield, right? That, that's what we were doing. It was our job to catch the bullets while Ron, the only medic on this day, was to keep them alive. And we did that for about two hours, two and a half, maybe even three hours, because we're about three hours in this firefight, um, keeping everyone alive so Ron can do his job. Well, I never will forget moving from one position to the next. Again, this is three and a half hours into this firefight, and I felt the most excruciating pain I've ever felt in my life. 
I leaned forward and I fell on, fr- on top of on my belly and then rolled over and I looked my leg, it was just hanging at a 45 degree angle only by an inch of flesh. Blood was skirting out and, and let me tell you what I did. I did like every human being would do, I cried. I screamed, God, make it stop! Right? I didn't do this heroic thing just because my name's John Wayne. I didn't get my green beret and say, you know, rub it on there and tell my sergeant I'd have time to bleed. I did like what every human would do. I thought about my kids, right? I thought about my family. I said, all right, here I am. I'm about to die. The other thing that I thought of after that initial shock of everything that was happening at the time was, I'll be damned, Spielberg got it right because it looked just like the movies, I swear. Like whenever you see in those movies, they get their head chopped off and the blood was just going straight out. I was like, I'll be damned, looky there, you know. I'm a redneck, man. I, simple sauce, that's, that's me, you know, simple jack, come on. And uh, I'll make it, you, you know, everyone here want to be a trauma doc? Here's how you do it. Air goes in and out, right? Blood goes round and round. There you go, class dismissed. That's what you got to do in order to keep people alive before they get into a hospital room, right? So I realized my blood was not going round and round as it was going on Afghanistan ground, so I put a tourniquet on, right? I also live by the creed that I'm dumb, but I know I'm dumb, so that almost makes me smart. Think about it. Come on. I know I'm too dumb to, make this, to get this right, so I'm going to ask, you know, 18 Delters, the guy next to me, that didn't all shot up and jacked up on Mountain Dew like I am. So I was like, Dave, you got to help me, man. And he, we went and put my tourniquet on, and uh, we would just move. If you don't know what a tourniquet is, it's like a nylon strap with a little stick that whenever you turn it around, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter to stop the blood loss, right? And that's exactly what happened. We would just watch it until it, the blood just, you know, would come out hard, soft, and it would just finally stop, and that's what we did. And it worked for a while. At that point, I picked up the weapon. I continued to fire because that's what you're supposed to do, right? People ask, Don, what'd you do? I just went to work, right? Because everybody has the, these Mike Tyson days where you get punched in the face and you're trying to react to contact, whether it's business or on the battlefield. What do you do? Do you just stick your boo-boo lamp out and say, oh, this sucks, I don't want to do it? No, you go to work, right? You block out all this noise and you just laser focus on what you know is great and then go kill it. And that's what I did. I just knew what I, I could do. I tried as best that I could to continue to be in the fight. And, and every single time that I would move, right, because you're, you're getting shot at, I'd have to move and try to get to some type of cover. My foot would just catch on a rock or whatever and flop, and it was one of the most excruciating. It was like getting shot all over again. And at that point, I actually grabbed my leg. I folded it up into my crotch, and I tied it with my thigh. People say, man, that's awesome. Like, well, that's the only thing I knew to do, right? Because I was thinking redneck thing, well, you got to splint it. I don't have a splint out here, so that's what I did. I put my boot in my crotch, which I said on national TV, by the way. My wife was like, really, John? Boot in your crotch? I'm like, well, I know what else is there, and I can't say that on TV, you know? <laughs> She's like, touche, you know? And uh, which, by the way, it was, it's a true story, right? So I said that, and then we actually went to the White House and, and saw the president and had them tell the battle on the congressional floor and I have a congressional record of them telling the Battle of Shock Valley, and the only quote that I got in this whole thing was, I put my boot in my crotch, right? <laughs> so now, hanging on my wall in a very regal, gold-plated congressional record is boot and crotch, so there we go. You know, so uh, there I am, and, and kicking my own ass at the time, right? Anybody else ever done that? This guy? No? All right. So you, uh, and, and we're just continuing to fight, and I never will forget the way that I saw my team sergeant, he was within me to you, Ashley, getting, uh, we were in the fight. I see him get shot right in the breastplate and he drops down to his knee. So I thought, wow, Scott's dead. And let me tell you, tell you about it again, that's not just another guy getting shot, that's our team sergeant. That's the guy that in my mind is the coolest guy on the planet, right? Scott Ford is 18 years in the military, started out in the 82nd Airborne, now he spent 16 or uh, 15 years in special forces, been to every cool guy school, like, you know, Chuck Norris wears Scott Ford underwear, right? That's how cool, I know you got young ones, y'all know who Chuck Norris is? Good karate guy, look it up. But in my mind, that's how cool Scott Ford was, right? So I just saw the guy that I knew that was getting us out of there get shot and drop to his, uh, drop to his knees. So what does that do to your mindset, right? Well, good, uh, thank goodness that his, his breastplate worked and he actually got up. He continued to fire because that's how awesome Scott is. And within five minutes of the first time getting shot, again, within five feet of him, I never will forget looking up at him and the back of his left tricep just started to flay out back because he got shot right through the shoulder. You know, whenever I saw that and I saw the blood and I saw the arm and everything, I realized, all right, we're probably not making it out of here. 
you know, think about what that's like, right? When you really, they're, they're, sure, there's the initial shot, God, I just got shot, what's going on? To now, it's been, it's been a while, I've got my, my wits about me, and now I'm seeing the guy that not only gets shot once, but twice, and thinking, yeah, we're not getting out of here, right? Think about what that feels like. You know, think about what, what goes through your mind when you realize, all right, this is real. This is not just a back, because we've been in pickles before, right? We've been in a firefight, that's what we're supposed to do. But at that moment, I realized, okay, this is bad. Fortunately, the powers that be thought the same thing, and they diverted almost every air asset in theater to our location. When I say air asset, I mean if it's fixed ring or rotary, if it had bombs and bullets on it, it came over to Shock Valley on April 6, 2008. And imagine like a, uh, what a, um, a, a fan blades look like, right? And every fan blade is a helicopter or a, an airplane. And every, as it's spinning, one comes in, drops a bomb. And the next one comes in, drops a bomb. And like, that's just what we kept doing for the, the remainder of the firefight, right? And I say the word bombs, and that really means nothing to y'all, right? It's, it's just something that blows up. Let me put things in perspective. There were 70 danger close airstrikes on that battle. Out of those 70 danger close airstrikes, think about what a 2,000 pound bomb, uh, the, the danger close protocol is for a 2,000 pound bomb. So danger close for a 2,000 pound bomb is about 10 football fields stacked end to end, right? 1,000 yards. It's really 1,000 meters, but American yards. The day that we had those dropped, they were dropped about 100 yards on top of our head. Imagine what that feels like to have a bomb of that magnitude going off, and just like the movies, right, the, in the movie 300, where they said the arrows blacked out the sun, well, it actually got dark. After they, you know, it, again, this one was another one of the times where it's pretty close to the movies, guys. Like, you, you hear it, it, aircraft inbound, aircraft 30 seconds out, brace for impact, right? So you mean everybody saying brace for impact, and you yell incoming, just like they would back in the days, right? We were yelling incoming, putting your head down, plugging your ears, and then feeling the most atrocious shock that you've ever felt in your life. You know, in fact, it was so bad that Dylan, our, uh, the first guy that got shot, he actually had his intestines ruptured because of how bad boulders were falling on top of us, right? Because what's a mountain? It's a rock. What happens when you blow it up? It makes small rocks, right? What happens when you're underneath those rocks? Gravity is the law, right? And that, that's what we were fighting at that time was all the rocks and boulders coming down. But it was the only time that they would ever stop fighting. Right, that was the only time that, 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 that was the thing about this battle, it was the relentlessness of those fighters. They just never stopped. Hour after hour after hour, just bap, 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 just talking guns the whole time. You know, it wasn't just this, this you, know, uh, you know, big, you know, uh, I say avalanche of gunfire at the very beginning, but it just sustained for so long. The way that we got off the mountain was we would drop that bomb, then we would roll off the backside of the mountain. Roll off the backside meaning I would just scoot my, on my butt to the end of the cliff and then fall off the cliff 10 to 15, 20 feet, hit the next level, remember, because we were climbing up traces, right? I'd climb, or we would just fall to the next trace, scoot on my butt to the next one after we dropped the next bomb, and we just wash, rinse, repeat all the way down and we got to the bottom. You know, I'll go back, because I always forget to tell these stories, because, uh, they're awesome. I love talking about uh, how awesome I am, and you'll just hear that's a joke right now. But uh, I never will forget, you know, after getting shot, you know, it had to have been 30 minutes, which in reality is probably like 15, right? But I remember thinking to myself, I'm the only one keeping me alive, and I'm not qualified for that, right? I, I, remember I put the tourniquet on, I'm doing my thing. No one else has checked me to make sure I've done a good job, give me a gold star, tell me I need to fix it or anything like that. So I thought, Hey, Ron, 18 Delta, Mr. Medic, why don't you come over here and check me out, right? And uh, I never will forget seeing his little peanut head just come over underneath Dylan's body, give me a thumbs up and say, you're good. I was like, F you, Ron, like, I know me good. Like, this is not good, Ron. You know, and, and just like we're laughing right now, we were laughing on the battlefield because I told him I was going to beat him with my leg when I saw him. I'm like, you got one job, Ron. Right, and, and, uh, but obviously he was smart enough to know that if I was gonna yell and cuss at him, that I'm not dying, right? And uh, so since I'm on Ron, I'll stay on him. You know, the, uh, on top of that, I never will forget as well, we, we got morphine injectors, right? Because that's what you get, because you, you know, he sucks to get shot. So they're trying to get the, the morphine and the doctor feel good so you can you know, not feel all the pain. Well, 
again, I'm like, hey, I got morphine. I might all try this out. So I picked it out. Remember, dumb, but I know I'm dumb, right? So I asked Ron, you know, Mr. 18 Delta, two years of school, Mr. Awesome. I was like, hey, Ron, what's side down? You know, I got one shot because when you stick it in, a needle comes out and it gives you morphine, right? That, it's an uh, uh, auto injector. You know, I was like, because there, there was a practice and then there's a real one, you know, and I'm like, hey, what's side down? He's like, purple. Cool. Got it. I did just like this and the uh, needle went in my thumb. Once again, Ron, you had one job, you know, and we're sitting here uh, again. We were, uh, if I'm lying, I'm dying. Like that, that's exactly what happened. We were laughing because uh, I told him, you know, I was going to beat him with my stump when I saw him. And, and uh, come on, Ron, 50-50 shot. You messed it up, you know. But uh, he actually ended up getting the Medal of Honor for that day, being the only medic to get all of us out alive, right? So that, that was, he had his hands full, but, you know, still sucked for me that day. I wanted to feel special, Jennifer. I did, you know. But uh, so anyway, we're back to the, uh, the base of the mountain. First the medevac bird comes in. You know, put yourself in my shoes, right? Or shoe at the time. Did I still have it? Does it count? I don't know. They say I lost my leg, but I'm like, I didn't lose it. I knew where it was. It just didn't work anymore, you know? And uh, I see the helicopter coming in and just think about, you know, after I, I first of all, I had to get drugged through a little river, you know, because the, the a wadi is really a valley. I don't know why you change continents. Oh, a valley turns into a wadi. But we we're in the middle of the wadi for this medevac bird to come in, right? It needs a little space for the, the rotors to spin. So that's a pretty good reason why it would be there. Well, between us and that uh, landing zone was a, a creek or a river that's 10,000 feet above sea level in April. So what do you think it is? It's just melted snow. So I got drugged through that. And I was like, come on, baby. Jesus survived a gunshot. Now I'm going to die of hypothermia. You know, come on now. A and uh, went through there. And I see we're in the HLZ. And I see the bottom of this Black Hawk, right? It, it, it's called a medevac, medical evacuation bird. It's like you see in the movies, one with the big red uh, cross on the side of it, right? It's coming down it's coming down it's called an elevator right it was taking the elevator down and i never will forget just seeing it fly off the radio communication that you heard we actually have communication of the pilot saying i'm hit i'm hit i'm going south the pilot literally was shot because of all the damage it was taking you know so now it's out of the way and we're in the middle of the water with no cover no concealment or anything so i got to get drugged back through the water and i had to go to the base of the mountain to get some type of cover for the next helicopter to come in the next helicopter, all the, it wasn't a medevac bird. All that it was was a UH-60 with a couple getter guns on it that said, hey, we'll go in, hop off, let them on. And that's exactly what happened. It came down, we're getting on, and, and, and you could hear the rounds hitting the helicopter as we're trying to get on there, right? You just think about all of the chaos of those rotors right next to this mountain and the bullets hitting it. It's just the most chaotic moment in the world, and I see the back of that pilot's helmet like an oak not moving saying get the guys on here we're not going to leave until we get them out you got anybody like that on your team it's pretty awesome right that's what the guy that was on my team and we actually got out of it and we started to go fly away and i thought all right here we go we're getting out of here and uh within five minutes of the first of the wheels turning off the ground we actually we started hearing beep 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 we had to do a crash landing because all the damage that that aircraft took getting us out of there couldn't make it to the to uh, jbad so we had to do a crash land i'm like goodness gracious gunshot hypothermia now plane crash come on now what's going on here you know this is a bad joke and uh but we 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 landed safely cross loaded and then we got into the uh into the the hospital you know and imagine what that's like for those soldiers that are waiting the incoming patients Imagine what that's like, because people forget just how young war is, right? You can join the military at 17 years old with the parent's permission and go to your combat lifesaver course, medic course, which is, quite frankly, three to six months, and you start working in a hospital helping people come in. Imagine what that feels like as an 18, 19, 20-year-old kid, and you're seeing like five, six, seven, eight guys that look like something from a Saw 5, you know, movie coming into there. They were just so overwhelmed, their eyes looked like golf balls because they were just fixated on what was happening. Well, the first guy that gets me is obviously looking at my leg. Well, for some reason, my lungs collapse and I stop breathing. Imagine how helpless that feels. When you got somebody so close to you, he's, he's, he's arm lengths away that can help you, but you can't yell, I can't breathe. And it was terrifying to be that close, but so far away from help, right? 
And the only way that I knew to get the guy's attention was I grabbed him, I pulled him about three sec inches away from me, I pointed out my mouth, which I thought was the I can't breathe symbol, right? I, I, maybe that is. If it ain't, it is now, right? So I grabbed him, I did that, then you see the lights go off, which is good. The bad thing about that, the only way that they could fix that was to give me not one, but two chest tubes without anesthesia, meaning they got a knife, they cut through my ribs, into my lungs, put a hose in there so it, my lungs would fill back up with air. Imagine how great that feels. In fact, the first time that they stuck it in me, I actually grabbed the guy, I threw, it over, I threw him over me because I was a little bit bigger back then. I had a lot of nicotine and hate and gym time. Now I got a business run. I don't get to, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays is about it. You know, and I uh, threw the guy over me and then he had his whole crew come hold me down and that's whenever I blacked out. I blacked out and apparently died twice on the table. They had to resuscitate me, not once, but they had to resuscitate me twice. And then I would find myself in Bagram waking up on April 7th. You know, before I go into that, I always want to tell the accolades of that day. Not that Green Berets like to do that, but I feel something needs to be told. On that day, 15 Americans went up against 250 Taliban fighters. And after six and a half hours, 70 danger close air strikes, there were 10 silver stars awarded, the most ever awarded in battle. Two of those were upgraded to the Medals of Honor, which made it the most prestigious battle for special operations ever. There were eight Purple Hearts. So out of the 10 guys that are on the side of the mountain, eight out of 10 of them got shot. Imagine what that's like. Who's here having a bad day? Eight out of 10 people getting shot day, right? You want to put that on a little motivational picture. Nobody's shooting at us. Eight Purple Hearts were given. The best thing about it, though, zero American killed. Think about how awesome of a fighting force that we have that 15 guys can go up against 250 and win. That's pretty awesome, right? The not awesome thing is waking up April 7th. Right, because everybody wants to hear, Hiram, I hope this works. It didn't work for you, right? Everybody wants to hear about April 6, 2008, but this is April 7th. April 7th, I wake up staring at ceiling tiles, terrified to look down. Terrified because I knew why I was there. I knew what had happened. And I knew the next moment when I looked down to see if I had one leg or two was going to be the most profound moment of my life. And I was scared. I procrastinated. I tried to think about something else. But the inevitability crept in, and I looked down, and that's whenever I saw that I only have one leg, forever. I say that that's the moment that I learned the meaning of the word can't, right? I can't walk, not without the aid of a prosthetic device. Without this, I'm a disabled man in a wheelchair. Without this, I'm a disabled man on crutches. Without this, I can't walk, I can't run, I can't climb, I can't be a good father, I can't be a good husband. And it was the most debilitating mental thing that I've ever had to deal with in my life was that moment. Because I cried. Right? Look at that face. I cried. Again, yeah, I didn't just want to be a Green Beret. I loved being a Green Beret. My name's John Wayne. I'm born on the 4th of July. If God ever put it in black and white what to do, he did it for me, and now he took my leg. Think about what that feels like for a 27-year-old guy that can jump out of airplanes, climb mountains, do anything to he. I knew I could do anything that I ever wanted to if I put my heart to it, and now I can't. And let me tell you the three things that helped me overcome that thing. Because that's what I want to talk about. Yeah, the battle's cool and all, and it, it, it gets a lot of good stuff on TV, but I'm more proud about what I've done since April 6th was that day here. The first thing that helped me overcome this injury, this word can't, is God. Let me tell you something. God is real. God loves me. And God is the reason why I am here today. Because there's no medical handbook that says that a guy gets shot on the battlefield and three and a half hours later, he's still in combat and he lives. But with God's it does. 
There's no tactical handbook that says, hey, 15 guys are going to go fight 250 for an entire day and nobody dies. But with God it does. Right? And, and just knowing that galvanized my faith to realize that it's not my plan I'm on, it's his plan. Right? And it helped me focus that. Because I had the why me's, God. Who's ever had that one? Right? Why me, God? Why'd you take my leg? Right? Because he took it. I didn't give it to him. He took that from me. Why did you do this? I'm a good guy. God, why are you doing this to me? But having that faith knowing that it's not my plan, it's his, it turned that why me into, hey, God, what are you teaching me right now? Hey, God, what is the lesson that I need to be learning? This, this, this uncertainty that I'm in, this doubt that I've got, all these reservations, I don't know what to do. What are you trying to teach me, right? And just pray that I got the patience to figure that out. Because let me tell you something. One thing that I learned from him taking my leg is that you always grow when you struggle. I'll say that again. You will always grow when you struggle. Because it is a struggle to be one-legged. It is a struggle to have this vulnerability. It is a struggle to have this insecurity. But knowing what it's like now, I can unequivocally tell you that losing my leg was one of the best things that's ever happened in my life. You know why? Because I've been taught what gratitude really feels like. Who here's ever had gratitude for waking up today? I sure the heck did. I did this morning. Who got up at 445 went and worked out? Oh, can you? <laughs> I thought you was with me. This guy, right? Who's here had gratitude for the lungs breathing the air that you're breathing? Right? Who's had gratitude for going home and seeing your kid? For the co-workers that are around you, have, being grateful for them. Right? With gratitude comes actual joy. Think about that. Don't be that person that wins the lottery and then bitches about, oh, I had to give taxes. You spent a dollar on a lottery ticket, now you won the lottery. Be grateful for what you've gotten, right? What else did I learn from this leg being taken from me? What about vulnerability? You think it's not vulnerable being there asking for help? You think it's not vulnerable sitting in a chair when you got other people around you with post-traumatic stress not knowing what they're going to do? But you know what else it's done? It's taught me to say, hey, can I get help? It's taught me to say, I need something, guys. I can't do this. It's taught me to reach out to my brothers and say, I'm not good. Right? And, and, and coming on the other side of that has been the reason that's helped me so much. What about humility? Right? Who's here needs some humble pie? Because I eat it every single day when I think I'm awesome and I take a step and I realize I'm not. Who here thinks that they're awesome and they're sitting in a wheelchair and they got to ask for help? Or they're in the hospital bed and they just poop their pants and now their wife's got to take care of them. Tell me that's not humiliating. Right? But, but having that humility come into you to realize people helping you is one of the best things and it's one of the strongest things that a man or a woman can do is ask for help. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't ask Ken Beam, hey, I need your help. And look where I am today. The second thing to help me overcome this word is this working or are you flipping it? You're flipping it? Okay, I'm just going to put it down. The second thing to help me is my family. I always say that my wife right there, Amy, she's the Green Beret of moms. She is the best thing. We homeschool our four kids. You know, I, I got uh, Emma Grace, Sam Houston. I, I tried to get to John Wayne Jr. Mama wasn't having it, you know, and he'd have a kid have John Wayne Jr. Jr. That's how we do it in the Waldens, you know. But uh, Andy Kate, she's our 12-year-old uh, now. And then Hannah Kyle, she, she's our 9-year-old. And it's uh, one of the best things, uh, that, that North Star or that North Seeking Arrow on your compass that every person's got to have, right? That's it. And to put it in perspective how powerful that is, I always talk about the day whenever I was in the uh, Bethesda, which are, uh, it was right outside of Walter Reed, right up in D.C., because I was in special operations, they gave us a two-bedroom apartment, and we were in the apartment, in, and um, I, had my, I just had two kids at the time, which I've had two kids before I was shot, and two kids after I was shot, so suck that Taliban. We don't die, we multiply. Come on. <laughs> Shoot me again and see what happens. I'll start adopting kids. We'll have a whole mess. Yeah. Anyway, 
the, uh, so I just had Sam and, and, and Emma at the time. Well, Amy and Emma went to the grocery store, so it was just me and Sam, right? And uh, I had my leg off at the time. You always say we're not real friends, so we get leg off time together, right? Jake, we'll get some leg off time one day, baby. It's going to happen. But I had my leg off, you know, I was in the wheelchair, and, and uh, I was, he was on the coffee table, and I was teaching him how to jump off of it, because that's what every Green Bray is supposed to do, is teach your son how to fall out of a helicopter, right, feet and knees together. And, uh, well, he actually took a step backwards, and he fell. Well, I, I did like every husband, father would do, is I stood up, and I took that step to catch him, but guess what? I don't have a leg. And I land on my stump, and it starts to bleed, and we had wood floors at the time, right? So I was thinking about what that stump felt like hitting that wood floor. And I'm four inches from his forehead because I jumped forward to still try to catch him. And we're just on the ground crying. I wasn't crying because of the pain. Frankly, I wasn't crying that he fell. I was crying because I knew why my son just fell. And it was because I was too doped up to catch him. That my reaction time was too slow that I was a zombie. Look, I'm not here to beat, uh, beat up the VA or the military and say they overprescribe and all this stuff. Look, if you, if you hurt, it's their job to help you, and they do a pretty dadgum good job doing it, right? They're not perfect. But I like to get, make it real. You want to put things in perspective? When I just say I'm a zombie, it doesn't mean anything, right? How about this? Who's here has ever heard of a Percocet? Almost everybody, right? Y'all know what it is. Do you actually know what's in it? Pretty good lesson right now, right? If a doctor is prescribing you something, because Percocet's just a name that a marketing company told the pharmaceutical company, hey, this isn't scary, right? Or this will sell more. What's actually in a Percocet is 325 milligrams of acetaminophen, which that's Tylenol, and then five milligrams of Oxycontin, right? That's the good stuff, right? That's that opioid that America just can't get enough of right now, right? They were prescribing me 80 milligrams of Oxycontin three times a day. On top of anti-psych meds, on top of anti-inflammatory meds, on top of anti-anti meds. I was taking about 10 different medicine at the time. So when I say I was a zombie, that's exactly what I was. So being on that floor four inches from my son's forehead crying together, I realized that never again is my son going to fall because of my sacrifice. And that's when I decided to get off of them. And I'm going to be real with y'all, it was one of the hardest things that I've ever done. Real talk. Yeah, my name's John Wayne. Yeah, I'm a Green Beret. That stuff is the devil. It took over me like nothing I've ever felt in my life. You think I don't have discipline? You think I don't have control over my body? I looked at it every single day and thought, when's the next time I could have it? Or, like any Green Beret, anything worth doing is worth overdoing, right? So it says take no more than three a day. Well, I'll just have six right now and have a party, right? Because that's what, that's what I can do. That was my mentality. And coming off of that was one of the hardest things that I ever did. However, it was one of the best things. Always grow through struggle, right? On the back side of that was one of the best things, and that's what helped me get over it. So the family was there with me, and if it wasn't for them, I could never do that. Next slide, please. The last thing that helped me overcome this word can't, this leg that will never grow back, it's you, Americans. Never underestimate the magnitude of what the two words, thank you, mean to a veteran. If you don't believe me, ask a Vietnam guy what it's like. Ask somebody that not only didn't sign up for war, they were drafted, right? They manned up, didn't dodge the draft, went over there, did the best that they could. You know what happened whenever they got back? They got spit on. They got called baby killers. There were Vietnam veterans of mine that said that they didn't even leave the airport in their uniform because they didn't want to get treated like a second-rate citizen. That happened here in America. You know what I would do if somebody did that to me? Well, I can't say that because this is a family show and... and uh, I'd lose my mind. You know what happened to me, though, for my sacrifice of my country? By you, Americans? I got a bear hug of just absolute, genuine thank you. And it was one of the most validating things that I've ever felt in my life. 
Like Hiram said, I had a race named after me. Who knew? Google it. John Wayne 400. If you ain't never been to a NASCAR, you better go. i like, that's America right there, Jack. You got Billy Bob with his six-pack to the millionaire with his motorhome up in the middle, and it is everything that awesome that is awesome, you know. And that was my first and last NASCAR. I'm like, you can't go to one after that, right, when your name's literally on it, right? Why? Why did they do that? Because they had a Your Heroes Here name, and you got to vote for your hero, and they put millions of dollars in signage and coverage and everything. I got to do everything on that race. Why? Because of my sacrifice for this country. You know, I got to go on amazing hunts that I never would have ever been able to go on. Why? Because they just genuinely wanted me to know that it was worth it. Right? And that's what your thank you does to me. It validates my sacrifice so I know it's worth it. Right? Because we all got to answer that question. When we lay our head down at night, is this worth it, right? Is all of this worth it? Whether it's your job, whether it's your kids, whether it's whatever it is, you do that for me. And because of that, that validation, y'all the reason why I was the first amputee to graduate Green Beret Sniper School. Y'all the reason why I not only did I run the Dallas Marathon, but I also did the Baton Death March twice, which is dubbed one of the hardest marathon routes on the planet, which is 6,000 feet above sea level. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, there's a marathon right there. Look at that. That's my kid saying, go daddy, right there next to me. Man, that was awesome. That sucked, but it was awesome now that it's over. But it's because of you that I actually wanted to do that, that I still wanted to not just be a citizen, but a successful citizen, right? Why? I started Gallantry Global Logistics, and our whole purpose is to provide the next mission for veterans. Right, to make sure that no matter what administration's in office, we will forever fight evil, right? So there will always be good men and women standing that line to defend our freedom. We need to help them when they get out of it. And so when I came up to Ken, I said, Ken, here's what my purpose is in life. I want to be able to do this, and I want to do it with some significance. And he said, hey, John Wayne, right on with that one. I'm right behind you. Why don't we do this? We'll partner together. You can start a company. We'll, uh, Gallantry Global Logistics will be a service-disabled veteran, minority-owned uh, 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 freight forwarding company that specializes in freight of consequence, and we'll go after all the diversity spend and just do great things, build jobs for veterans, and be awesome. How about that? One meeting, right. Not, not market research for decade or, or months to, and spending you know, all this money about, oh, is this going to poll well? Not all of this you know, just thought process, that, are the economics going to work? No, we live with purpose. And it's because of you that I was able to do that. And we're going to go change great things, change lives and do great things. All right, I'll leave you all with three things. I know you all probably tired of hearing me speak, right? I, I'm about off him. So uh, I never will forget somebody asked me, hey, what do you want people to get from hearing you speak? It's a pretty big deal, right? I never really thought about it. I just blacked out when I finished, everybody was clapping. That's kind of my little way out. Uh, go ahead, next slide. That was the Baton Death March. That's mile 22. And I still had the nerve to say, hey, the wind's blowing. Let's wave old glory. How awesome is that? I love the guy sitting on his rucksack next to me. <laughs> he tired, boss. Look at him. All right, next slide. So anyway, I had somebody ask me, what do you want me, uh, people to get from hearing you speak? And here's what it is. I really thought about it and I prayed about it. Stop being good. Start being great. I'll say it again. Stop being good and start being great. Right? That's something different for everybody in here, right? That's a different meaning for every single one. It could be a habit that you need to get or maybe a habit that you should quit, right? It, should, it could be a relationship that you need to just bring in close or maybe one you need to run away from, right? They're fun on the weekends, but boy, during the week, it's tough. Who's ever had one of those? Come on, I know. Let's get real. Stop playing, right? That, that's what it is. You want to know what it was for me that helped me stop being good and start being great? I'll get real with you again. It was drinking. You know, the military, I always say they got this lineage of just drinking in the, you know, while you're there, right? Whenever something good happens, you high five, you go have a beer, right? What happens when something bad happens? You low five and you say, hey man, let's go have a beer. Well, they also, you know, they, they teach you how to deal death, but they don't teach you how to deal with it. 
Think about that. I could come into this room with surgical precision under the cover of darkness, look at you in the whites of the eyes, pull the trigger, and sleep at night. You know what I couldn't do? I couldn't get that call that Ryan Savard's dead, that Willie Lover's dead, that Dave Hurt's dead, that Aaron Bellagio's dead, that Robbie Miller's dead, that Dave Banner's dead, that Chris Kyle's dead. There's 30 names that are embroidered on the center console of my truck of Green Berets and SEALs that aren't deployed, they're dead. And I didn't know how to deal with that. What did I do? I drank. Because that's what you're supposed to do, right? Pour one for the homies, toast to the fallen, that's what I know to do. I never will forget the night I got told that Chris Kyle died. If you know who Chris was, he was a Navy SEAL that wrote the book American Sniper. I was the, the lead instructor at his company, which I thought was awesome that the Navy SEAL needed a Green Beret to teach for him. <laughs> He's like, you just write books, baby. I'll fight the war, right? I'll be the real guy. Chris was a great man. He believed in purpose. He believed in giving back. He believed in changing lives with what God had given and blessed his life with. And the day that he paid the ultimate sacrifice, I got that call. Hey, Chris isn't with us. I was at Charlie Mike's at Fort Bragg, literally signing out of the Army that day, or I would have been with Chris. You know what I did that night? I drank. He loved Jack Daniels, so guess what I did? I got into some Jack Daniels. The next morning, I never will forget that feeling of just disappointment. Disappointment, you know, I, it, I knew that day that I'm never drinking again. And, had, you know, I know we've all had that day, oh, I'm never drinking again. It wasn't that day. It was the day that I realized that if his life mattered that much to me, that I got to do this, by God, I owe it to him to live well. Right? Because Chris don't have the choice of what type of person he's going to be, but I do. Aaron doesn't have the choice of what type of father he's going to be, but I do. You know what the hardest thing that I've ever done in my life was being stateside watching Aaron Bellagio's body get lowered out of that private aircraft with the American flag draped over it. His wife and three-month baby, who he never even met yet, was right there crying. What do you say to them? I'm sorry? So you're supposed to just drink it up? That's what you're supposed to do to honor them? No. So I quit that day. That's the day that I said, you know what? I know what this guy looks like. Let's try the other guy, right? So my entire adult life, I've been the guy that's on the sauce, love it, let's go have a good time. Let me see what the other guy is. And let me tell you, here's the secret. Brutal honesty. Because that moment, when I looked myself in the mirror, I had brutal honesty with myself to say, I'm not good. And I said, let's figure out how we're going to do that. And, and it was one of the hardest things I've ever done, get drinking. I'll tell you, I felt like Ricky Bobby. I don't know what to do with my hands, right? Being at a social event, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, coach. This is just what you're supposed to do, right? But let me tell you something. On the, again, always to go through struggle, nine years of sobriety has been the best gift that I've ever given myself, right? Because now I'm not just a husband, but I'm a loving husband. Guys, you do what you did to get her, to keep her, right? That's why we do date night now. That's why we have intimate times together. Not just that intimate, we're chaser, not like that, but we, you know, we communicate, talk to each other. Feelings, girls have them, I think I got one. We talk about it, that, it's a good one. But if I wasn't sober, I would never do that, right? As a, as a, as a father, I'm not just a father, right? I, I'm a loving father. Who's here right there gonna walk down Disney holding your daughter's hand, wearing some ears, and I got me a little Yoda shirt on, huh? Come on now, that's awesome. Look, he's got a little night vision. Did you notice that little, little, little Yoda thing? Sobriety would never, I've never done that without sobriety because now that's what those kids need, right? They need a father that says, hey, come on, y'all, let's go be awesome together. You know, I, I, we, we turn that, that bad news, right? When something bad happens, you're just going to drink. You know what I do now when I get that call? It inevitably is going to keep happening. I take my kids to the movies. I take my wife out to dinner. We do board games, right? We live well for them. And sobriety helped me do that. All right, so stop being good. Start being great. Next slide. Next one is be a part of something that's bigger than you. That's a pretty good representation of that, right? Be a part of something that's bigger than yourself. I'm so tired of this selfie generation that we have now, that where everybody wants a bigger house, a bigger paycheck, bigger following on what Twitter face, whatever it is, right? The bigger vacation spot. That's what they want, right? 
But think about what you're doing that's bigger than you. I tell these kids when they take a selfie, think about being selfless. Right? You want to turn this country around, let's turn the selfie generation and think about the greatest generation and what it was like with them. Right? How we came together as a country to win World War II. And by the way, it wasn't just soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that won World War II. No, it was Americans that spent $18 billion buying war bonds to fund the war. That's awesome, right? People forget about Rosie the Riveter, right? Left her house, went into a, a, a manufacturing facility, was building planes. People forget that Ford, Chevy, and Dodge stopped building cars, completely rehauled their manufacturing facilities. They built Willys Jeeps. More Willys were built in a Ford plant than in Willys plant, and they didn't own, uh, own Willys. How awesome is that? They built planes, they built tanks. We came together as a country, why? Because we had that compelling necessity to help each other. Only because we're Americans and that's what we do. Let's remember that we didn't just get our freedom when we fought tyranny 246 years ago with diplomacy. We got it from good men and women dying to give us that from a king. And not only from that did we get liberty, we also got the American ideal. That's what is sacred in this country, that we can come here from any color, any race, any religion, any creed, and come to this country and be what? Be American. How awesome is that? Nowhere else can you go there and just have that brotherhood to know we're all in this together. I love the fact that whenever the Olympics are on and they say, hey, America's on the char uh, starting block, you got no idea what color they are. That's awesome, right? So bringing back unity, why don't we start as our identity remembering that? Remembering that uh, uh, the founder of the Progressive Party is Teddy Roosevelt. He eloquently said that there is no 50-50 with being an American. You either are or you're not. You know, I always tell you, like, I, I, I'm 100% Texan because my mom's Mexican, my dad's a roughneck. I grew up on oil and tacos, baby. I love my mom's heritage. I love being Mexican. I love everything about it. I really do. You'll never hear me refer to myself as Mexican-American. Why? When I got shot, Mexico did nothing for me. But Americans did. So we want to come together. Let's start as our identity of just being American. Right? Not African-American or Asian-American or Mexican-American. Let's remember that we are all one ideal and have grace when talking about our flaws because trust me, we've got plenty of them. I'm not even trying to be naive to say that we don't have stuff to fix. We do. But we're never going to fix it if we all talk about divisiveness. We're going to fix it if we talk about what unites us. That's what made Martin Luther King so awesome is that's what he did. He stood up for what was right, but he didn't do it in a condemnation mode. Right? He didn't just point fingers and say, they're the bad, we're the good. This divisiveness about Republican or Democrat, I always say, I didn't lose my leg for Republican or Democrat. I lost it for American. Right? And I'm proud to have done that. And I'd give another one for you. Because we are the best country to ever exist on the planet. And it's because we come here to live under these ideals. And let's remember that and have grace when talking about it, okay? Because you think the American dream's not real? Think about me. You know, I say I got a Mexican mother and a roughneck father. What I didn't tell you is the first memory of my dad was seeing him in an orange jumpsuit chained to eight other convicts walking in front of my grandma's town car going from the uh, prison cell to the courthouse to get sentenced to jail. My mom was already in jail. I was five. You know what I did? Went to live with my grandparents, like so many do, right? Grew up in a little redneck town. You know about it, right, Julie? 3,500 people, $10 million football field. Woo, go Goats. Little redneck town, no aspirations, no nothing. You know, I never had, and my grandparents, don't get me wrong, they raised me great. God bless them for that. But our mindset was you better have a job, not you can do great things. That's two totally different things, right? I joined the Army. Why? I needed a job. And to go from that little redneck town with no parents and then just living by my grandparents to being on that parade field, donning that green beret, then ultimately being in the Oval Office, with the president and then being in the presidents in the presence of another president how awesome is that huh that happened here 
And I will refuse to believe that this is a bad place because that is what it has given me. Why? Because I own my responsibilities to go be as great as I can or as great as I don't want to be, right? So be a part of something that's bigger than yourself. Let's come together and remember that. And the last thing, next slide. Be worth it. Be worth those men and women that came before you to give us the freedoms that we have. Be worth those 30 names that are embroidered on my console. Be worth this leg that will never grow back. Be worth the holidays that I will never have. Because I'm telling you, to me, you are. When you say thank you for my service, I don't say you're welcome. I say you're worth it. You're worth this sacrifice. You are worth those men and women dying because it is worth it. What we're doing here today to learn with each other, what we're doing here today to have the fellowship with each other, to meet others, to get clo uh, closer, uh, closer to everybody, to learn from each other, this is worth it. And so just remember that. So thank you so much. God bless you.